Glad to see you all here today, um, braving the cold weather, and, and turning out to see our speaker today, Chris Kamansky of Design Talk. He has um, 35 years of experience in business development and marketing, so he has um, a lot of background in, in uh, the topics he's going to talk about today, which is six ways that you'll uh, need to grow your business. Uh, and we're all interested in growing our business, there's no doubt about that. Um, and we uh, would like to uh, recognize our sponsor today, but she's not with us in the, in the attending today. That's uh, Leslie McGraw um, of uh, Let's Go uh, Social Media and Marketing. Um, so we'll, we'll, I'm sure we'll hear from her next week if she has one more week on her sponsorship. Um, if you have any interest in, in being a sponsor for um, LA2M, uh, just see me um, after the, the talk today, and uh, we can give you some more information about that. Um, and we also need to uh, present our official LA2M t-shirt to Chris. What a surprise. I recognize the surprise look. And uh, Carter's not here to take a picture, but when he comes in, we'll get one of the pictures of that. So the official presentation of the LA2M t-shirt. Yay. <laughs> We'd like to, to thank Roger for being here to uh, video the event and also a live stream event for us for all those people who can't be here in person. We're glad to have that. Um, and LA2M is, is a nonprofit organization. So in order to um, support our hard costs, we uh, pass the hat. Um, suggested donation is five dollars. Um, you're not required to, to donate anything, but um, if you'd like to, to help support our organization, we, we would very much appreciate that. Um, and uh, without further ado, we'd like to recognize Chris as our speaker today, and on with the show. Now, can you hear me through the microphone? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Yes. Um, yeah, well, thank you so much. Thanks for coming out, especially on such a cold day. Now, uh, I've uh, titled this The Only Six Ways You'll Ever Grow Your Business, and I don't know, maybe there's seven or eight or something, and you can help me add to the presentation. I've tested out this message with some people, though, and they seem to relate to it. Um, I, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on introduction because Mary Lou already introduced me, and then um, secondly, you'll get um, a sense for who I am and what we do through the course of the uh, presentation. Plus, we got a lot of material to cover. I do want to tell you, too, um, my contact information is at the end. I will, you know, as follow-up to this, you can get in touch, send me an email, I'll send you the presentation, call if you have questions. I would recommend you keep your questions till the end, um, unless they're really burning, because as I say, I have quite a bit of information that I'm going to try to get through. Okay, these are the six ways, the only six ways you'll ever grow your business. We're done. No, I'm kidding. Um, the, uh, just really quickly, they are, for explanation reasons, we're going to go over each one of them individually. You know, retain and grow your uh, current customer base. Um, get referrals. Network so as to meet people who can become your customers. Get found, mostly online. Um, do very targeted prospecting. And then use interruption methods such as advertising and publicity or so to get people who don't know anything about you to look into you. So that's what I've kind of defined as these six ways. Now I'm going to tell you um, where kind of this realization came to me originally. Back in the early 90s, I worked for a company called Clio Communications, a data communication software that was kind of split between here in Ann Arbor and Rockford, Illinois, of all places. And um, we were spending a lot of money on the bottom two things there, on mainly on advertising, publicity, and direct mail. And we were largely driving a lot of response. We were doing the classic, you know, offer the educational information, the white papers, the solutions guides, the tutorials, the case studies, all that kind of stuff in our advertising and our direct mail especially and getting lots of response. We were just addicted to the response. The reply cards would come in every day and we'd just pat ourselves on the back and how the stack kept getting bigger and bigger. And we were also finding ways to do this more efficiently, so we were actually spending less money on it every year and getting more response. But meanwhile, the financial people from the company kept coming to us and saying, when we look at where business was really coming from, 
We can't trace anything to those prospecting efforts and those publicity and advertising and direct mail efforts. Most of our business was coming from current customers, from referrals, and we were also doing pretty well by attending industry conferences, you know, and meeting people. Well, so the, um, the, the effect was that at that lower end, we were spending all the money and getting all the response, but all the really results, the quality and the good results were coming from the high end of it. Now, to support that, a few, um, over the last couple of years, a Spark Marketing Roundtable has had on their panels a couple of times a gentleman named Eric Jacobson from, at the time, he was with a company called Transloom. And he ex uh, told a similar story about his, how his company, when he was the chief marketing officer, they invested a lot of money in driving traffic to their website. And they, like us who got addicted to response, they got addicted to traffic. They would look at the Google Analytics and just say, wow, look at those spikes. It's just going up and up and up. But then he took over um, financial responsibilities for the company as well and started to scrutinize where business came from and had almost exactly the same experience, which caused him to direct their marketing dollars a little bit differently. Now, we're, we'll go through you know, a detail on each of these steps. But I do want to point out, though, that the hierarchy of um, ways to grow your business can vary from organization to organization. As it turns out, um, Transloom was very, very similar in their model as, as Clio Communications was. But for instance, um, we know some people in the Celine community who just absolutely depend on getting found online. They sell relatively low cost items online. And so for them, getting found, you know, boots right up to the top. In another way, too, we've worked with a couple of um, architecture firms who have very, very targeted markets. In one case, they really feel they have only 300 prospects or customers in the whole world. And so hence, they put most of their emphasis on prospecting. You know, among those people that they don't already know in that 300 person community or 300 company community, they work on driving the conversation with those people. So this model can vary, but um, you know, we frequently find that it does fall into this pattern. Now, a couple of times in this presentation, I'm going to use the example of Daycroft Montessori School. That's one of our clients. You know, it's a prominent private school in Ann Arbor, been around a long time. Their admissions director tells me, she tracks this stuff very, very well, better than most of our other clients do, that this is the pattern that holds pretty consistent for them. About 50% of all new inquiries that come in that are serious are basically family and friends. You know, people that already know Daycroft, referrals, etc. Another 30% claim to find Daycroft online. Daycroft is skeptical that the number is actually that big because a lot of people use that when they can't really remember where they heard about you. They might have seen a story about Daycroft, they might have seen the billboard, you know, who knows what it was. But at some point they did go online to look them up and then they told Daycroft that that's how they found them. And then, the other, then only about 20% is everything else. You know, the events that they sponsor where they might have a table and a display where they might meet people, um, their advertising, their publicity, and so on. So these patterns do kind of hold. And so hence, that's why when we first meet with a new client and they're allowing us to um, you know, help them with their marketing strategies and plans, we always look first. Is there more that you can be doing, first of all, to retain and grow your existing business? So we'll start there. Um, with the basic principle of customer retention. Who wants to complete this statement? Your best future customer is? Your current customer, of course. And um, so again, as I say, we typically start there. Of course, I think, you know, whether you have a formal customer relationship management system or not, you have to do something to, to uh, manage your existing customer relationships. Here is a place where these days we think that social media really comes into play. 
Typically, you do social media with people that you know. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little while. And then something else that we look at. Now, I'm only, you know, I have to warn you here up front, I'm only going to touch on these different methods. Almost all of these specific things that I bring up here, like customer relationship management, social media, you know, surprise and delight or appreciation marketing, as some people call it, um, are subjects for seminars in themselves. And so, you know, if there's something that jumps out at you, you're probably going to have to pursue that and find, you know, other people that can talk you through that. But these are, these are some of the main retention tools that we talk with our clients about and um, often get them to invest in as a way to retain current clients. Well, I just kind of gave away my next answer, but that's um, a lot of people say, well, I'm just starting a business. I don't have current clients or customers that I can retain and grow. Well, where do you start? Typically, you start with family and friends. When my partners started Design Hub back in 1999, they had both worked for another creative services firm that had folded. And the owner of it, he, he chose to fold it. It was actually a viable business. But he said, there's no non-compete clause. You can go after any of the clients that you, you know, nurtured through this company. And so they had a basis of you know, loosely defined friends that they could start with. When I came on board a couple of years later, I brought some of my existing relationships in as well. And then you grow from there. So if you're starting a new business, hey, you know, this isn't rocket science. Start with family and friends. Okay, now referrals, again, complete the statement. The most effective form of advertising is and probably always will be word of mouth, word of mouth advertising, of course, or just word of mouth. Um, good word of mouth. And um, how do, you, how do you get referrals? Again, not rocket science. You do a great job. You'll make fans. They'll recommend you. Um, but sometimes people want more. They say, okay, what's the, what's, what's the secret? What's the secret to doing such a great job that you'll create raving fans? Well, here's a possible secret. It may not be the secret. Um, and the source of it is um, a method that I found useful over the years. It's explained in this book called Strategy Pure and Simple 2. And um, the author, this Michel Robert, uh, he runs a consulting firm that works with organizations of all sizes. And the basis of, that, of their strategy pure and simple process is, is that first you need to identify the driving force of your business. I'll give you a few examples. When you know the driving force of your business, then that kind of tells you what areas that you should make exceptional investment in. So here are some of the examples, and then we'll probably get to the one that's most relevant to you. A product-driven company, we'll use the example of Toyota. They make cars. They're a product, their driving force is a product. Where they, you know, they have to be excellent at everything. They gotta run their finances well, they gotta run their sales well, they have to run their manufacturing well, et cetera, et cetera. But where they make exceptional investments is in the product development process. You know, making that process work better so they can get better cars out to market faster. And now another example is a technology-driven company. Kind of similar in a way, Honda. You know, they're a car company, but they're really, their driving force is their engine technology. So where they, what they stress is research and development and then also applications marketing, finding different places where their engine technology can really make a difference. Cars, motorcycles, lawnmowers, generators, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Market-driven company, example of that is Procter & Gamble. They basically serve the homemaker market with practically anything that they might need, or at least as many things as they can provide. And so, hence, they make their exceptional investment in market research, really, really understanding that market and what that market needs. Now, I suspect, how many people here are in professional services? Quite a few of you. Yeah, some hands go up. Um, in professional services, your area of exceptional investment should really be how you deliver that service. So hence, process development. And one thing that we have found over time is that if you can make things easy for people, they'll love you. And when you think about it, 
a lot of the online services, the, the, the uh, killer apps that have developed over time, do exactly that. You know, Twitter makes it easy for you to follow and be followed. Facebook makes it easy for you to um, stay in touch with your family and friends, essentially. Um, Google makes it easy to find information or find things. Amazon makes it easy to shop and buy. Wikipedia makes it easy to learn things, sometimes of you know, dubious accuracy, but still, it's a good tool. You know, um, Staples, notably, has picked up on the whole easy theme as their basis. Well, here's another example from my personal experience. We work with the Corner Health Center in Ypsilanti. That's a, a nonprofit that provides primary health care to young people aged 12 to 21. And anything the Corner can do to make it easier for those people to, uh, to be seen by the the corner to get there, to wade through the insurance maze. A lot of the folks that they serve are practically homeless and have no hope of insurance. And, and to enjoy consistency in care. So again, their primary focus, really more than anything else, is their process, how they can make things easier for their clientele. So that's a clue to you. If you're in professional services, make something easy, and they're going to love you. They'll refer you to everybody. Now, networking, how many of you know this statement? 90% of success is showing up. Of course, these are all cliches by now, but they, the cliches usually have some use. And um, well, you're, you're networking right now by coming here. And we, there was a speaker here some time back talking about social media. I can't remember his name, but he went to work for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, as I recall. Yeah. And um, he said, you do social media with people you know, like, and trust. Well, my belief is you do business with people you know, like, and trust. You're not going to do business with people on the basis of an ad, an ad that you saw or even the search results that came up. they got to know you and like you and trust you before they're really going to do business with you. I mean, that's for anything that's beyond just a simple, you know, um, $20 purchase online or something like that. And, you know, how do you get people to know, like, and trust you when they don't already know, like, and trust you? Well, one of the great ways is to meet them at events like this. And, you know, here's some, some of the obvious uh, kinds of organizations that you can get involved in. What I found from my personal experience is when this really pays off is when you volunteer or you really get involved. My personal experience, you know, some years back I've been investing some time in working with the old Ann Arbor IT zone, which has since been absorbed by Spark. It wasn't really going anywhere. My business partners were telling me, what have you got from all that time you're spending there? But then one day Diane Durant, who was the executive director, asked me to get on the programs committee. And from there, everything really started to happen. And a lot of good things did happen because I got to know people intimately, and we developed that, you know, that uh, knowing and liking and trusting each other. So that's my recommendation to you if you're going to pursue that volunteer. Now, getting found. You can finish this one if you'd like. Be there when your customer needs you. You know, um, usually people get found when somebody has a need or a want, and they look for it. But you do want to get found. Now, there's countless seminars. There have been a lot here on search engine optimization. Um, you probably already know the three most common rules that people tell. You know, deliver relevant content, up update your site frequently, and get other sites to link to you. We've thrown in a couple of others on our own, which is basically be patient and persistent. Our clients that have done the best in getting found in competitive markets have taken their time to get there. It's typically taken a year to 18 months from the time they launched a new site before they really started to rank high. Um, so you can't expect the results overnight unless somebody has the magic formula. But I'm skeptical of magic formulas. The advice I give to you is no tricks. Really just deliver great content, update it a lot, Drive traffic to your site. Become a valued resource. Don't even think about being tricky. I mean, you don't want to do things that hurt search, but you know, if it's if it if it smells like a trick, it probably is, and it's eventually going to hurt you. And then, of course, these days we've added you know the sixth rule here, which is you got to pay attention to social, local, and mobile. As other speakers here and at other places have said. Um, lots of times people, especially on mobile devices, they don't want to find your website. They just want to find your phone number. They want to find the map to how you 
that you know you get there your menu if you're a restaurant things like that and these other tools besides your website can often you know do that work much better to help you get found on that stuff now prospecting um, this can really come into place so I'm going to give you a couple of quick case studies here when it comes up but how do you think I'm trying to finish this statement choose what Wisely. Choose wisely. That, that's, oh, that would be great. Well, it is related to that, but, what, but the statement is really is choose who you want to do business with. That's what prospecting is all about. And the key point here is we often use this phrase in our company that's like, who can tell you how? In other words, whoever you're targeting, that can indicate what method you use. And in so many cases, working with our clients, they think they've got a big market. It turns out to be that their core prospects are really relatively few. Here's several examples. You know, we um, worked with a bank that was really targeting no more than 250 companies for you know commercial banking. Another uh, software developer that had kind of two markets: hospital pharmacies and hospital uh, schools of pharmacy. There aren't that many of them, and there weren't that many people within those organizations that they wanted to talk to. Um, on and on and on. The Corner Health Center, really their core market are their referrers. And there's only a few dozen physicians and a few dozen social workers that are really going to be the core <laughs> referrers for them. So there's many, many examples. Now, I'm going to tell you the quick, I've used the story a lot, but forgive me if you've already heard it. We did some work years back for ideation, the gift retail Good marketing, you have to retailers marketing service, you know, the, they do catalogs and put products out on your, um, in your store. I met the president of um, Ideation, he had just taken over the company from his father who had passed on, and he said he needed 50 qualified prospects as quickly as he could get them, and that's the challenge he put forth to us. Their salespeople told me, well, our market is 60,000 gift retailers across North America. And that our message is that we've hammered on them for years is this is a proven method to increase your sales by 10 to 40 percent. Well, when we dug in, they let us do some research into their market. When we threw in all the qualifiers and then looked at commercially available mailing lists and databases, prospect databases, you know, good stuff, not the cheap, cheap mailing stuff. They got their core list of prospects down to 700. Well, that's a lot different than 60,000, and that indicates different methods might make sense. That we also found too from researching their existing uh, customers, even some that had gone away, that the, the message about growing your sales by 10 to 40 percent was not cutting through. That's kind of like the stuff you get on your email every day that you just delete, 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 delete. You know, it was they were getting tons and tons of this message. They said it was really that being part of um, ideation put better products out on their um, uh, you know shelves. This improved their, that plus the um, catalogs, the beautiful catalogs and direct mail pieces that they got from being part of the service really enhanced their image within their marketplace. And then the peer, all being part of this buying group and having peer-to-peer -peer networking with similar store owners but not competitive store owners. The example I always use is the store owner out in Cape Cod that talks to the store owner out in Carmel, California all the time. You know, they couldn't be farther away from each other in the country, but they have very similar markets. And so they were sharing ideas all the time. And that's really why they subscribe to ideation services every year. Well, here's, so here's what we recommended that ideation do. They selected the 700 core prospects. They sent a new collateral piece that we helped them produce called the Gift Marketing Success Guide. Had little success stories in it. Not really just lists of their what they do. The cover letter promised that somebody from ideation would follow up. And they did. They showed up. And they made the call. They qualified the prospects, you know, using kind of classic solution selling or Joe Marr techniques too, if, if you know if you know Joe, and um, and then with the people that were qualified, they visited with them and went through the whole usual day and a half process of getting these people signed up, <coughs> and the results were that they got their 64 qualified prospects. I've never gotten a definitive number and how many of those turned into actual customers, but I assume it's quite a bit because Tom tells me that they continue to use the. Uh, service regularly, or this, the same basic strategy for many of their other efforts. Similarly, Bank of Washington has been, since been acquired twice, but they've targeted on 250 people. They had a, a, uh, 
a mobile banking service. So they were actually able to deliver something really fun. They started with their 30 best prospects, the kind of the lowest hanging fruit. They delivered a cake and they got 30 customer visits. The funny one was they sent the cake. Um, the president of this company in Ypsilanti was on vacation that Friday. The cake arrived on a Friday. He came in on Monday and there was an empty box with just the crumbs and a note from his staff saying, sorry, we ate the cake. Well, he got in touch with the bank and said, come on over with another cake and we can talk business. And they did. It became, it became actually the bank's biggest commercial loan. And I'm not supposed to say the name of the company. Um, okay, so here's the basic formula. Target, get it down to your core prospects. Almost all of our clients can do that. And one of the points, too, is that you don't always have to address your entire marketplace. You don't have to base a program on, on the need to get everybody. If you have some good prospects, that's better than nothing, and that's a great place to start. And then do all the other stuff that I, that I described. Now, then, you, if, when you do get them as a client, then you can build them and grow them strategically. Now, why is this? Well. Why does a number of our clients seem to be really interested in these direct methods, um, even in this interactive world? Well, I, I kind of trace it back to a, a long time ago <laughs> when I was in college. I had an a, a anthropology professor here named Conrad Kotak, if anybody ever had him. And it was on an American culture class. And he was talking about the, um, the phenomenon that he'd noticed through, throughout out of American culture and probably other cultures as well is for every trend, there's always its opposite. So, as for example, as people were moving further and further out into the suburbs and the exurbs, other people were saying, you know, forget that, I'm gonna move downtown. And so both trends were happening at the same time. One of uh, probably George Lucas's reasons why Star Wars was such a success is that all science fiction, at least in movies up to that point, was always that kind of cold, forbidding, scary, um, kind of 2001-ish kind of thing. And he said, hey, let's make space look fun and adventurous, like an old Western or a pirate movie or something. And that was one of the reasons that um, Kotak was uh, certain that Star Wars was so successful. As more and more people shop in big box stores, more and more people are also saying, buy local, buy local, buy from the small guys, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, opposite trends. And so, as interactive marketing becomes more and more important, strangely enough, more and more of our clients come back and say, yeah, that's great, we want to do that, but we also want to do direct, and we want to do it really, really well. So I think it's the two trends working at the same time. Now, occasionally here I'm just going to throw out some little bits of stuff that you might find useful, and then somebody can warn me if I'm going too long. Okay. Um, years ago, I used to follow a direct marketing expert named Tracy Emmerich, who used to go to the seminars and so on, he was terrific. I don't know what he's doing these days, but um, he would always say that this is the, basically the formula for success in direct marketing. 40% of the success of your program will be based on getting the message to the right people. You know, your list, essentially. Another 40% will be the strength of your message, the strength of the offer that you're making to them. So getting the right message to the right people. And only 20% is really going to be driven by the format of the mailing, um, the colors, the type size, all that, the exact wording. It's basically get the right message to the right people and you're 80% of the way there. Well, his point was that people don't spend enough time on building their prospect lists. They have sometimes they use old lists, they use lists that are junky lists. And he said, sometimes the best thing you can do is just sit down and build your list one name at a time. And that, in, in fact, that's probably always the best way if you can afford the time because you'll be pretty sure that it's going to be a highly pre-qualified database of prospects. Okay, so now we're up to, you know, really the, the sixth of our six sure are, you know, ways to grow your business. And that's basic interruption, as, as we're calling it these days. Um, when I got started in this field 35 years ago, something like that. Um, you know, the formula that used to get passed around a lot was this, you know, AIDA, which um, meant, if anybody remembers, you know, get attention, build interest, create desire, and get action. Attention, interest, desire, action. But recently, some of the people who create formula, formulaic ways of advertising have been using a, a model more like this. You interrupt people in whatever they're doing, you engage them, in, the, in your message, you educate them, preferably, about something that has a value to them, and then you make an offer so as to drive action. 
So I'll give you a quick example here. I'll use Daycroft again. We work with them a lot. We often use this message. They have two teachers in every classroom, uh, full-time teachers. The idea is to uh, get people to think, hey, that must be a pretty personalized approach to learning. You know, my kids will get a lot of uh, individual attention there. And so they do this in ads, signs at um, local sports venues, you know, that reach families, um, billboards, and so on. So that's how they interrupt with a, you know, somewhat intriguing message, at least for parents who are worried about that. Then they engage largely through their website. They trust that people will go to their website. Their website is like loaded with information. We're in the process right now of working with them on an audit of their website so as to bring it more into, uh, you know, kind of modern standards. It's been, it's a good site, but it's been um, pretty much basically the same for a number of years. Um, but they engage there. Um, when people get really interested, they send this big, massive, uh, that's not massive. There's a 16-page insert, but it gives you really, really detail on their on their offerings. Every all the way from preschool through young five, kindergarten, uh, enrichment programs up to grade six. And um, even though a lot of the stuff there is on the website, they get an amazing number of requests for this information packet. And then, of course, then they make a bunch of offers to the to the um, along the way. Um, they have open houses. They, you can schedule a personal tour. And then for people with really young kids. They invite them to one free lesson of their Montessori Fun Days, which is their parent-toddler program that introduces parents and their kids to their method, which merges Montessori and other learning methods. So that's essentially the the uh, uh, the interrupt method. Now, again, just in the uh, the spirit of just some kind of things out here that might be useful to you, a lot of people who um, have been doing advertising and direct marketing for years and years and years essentially get it down to there's two appeals that work. Um, you can appeal to somebody's pain, their need, what's keeping them up at night. That's typically most true of business-to-business -business advertising, business-to-business -business marketing, because you give them a hope for a solution. And you can tell oh, it went from one to four. Oh, well, anyway, there's only two. Um, and you appeal to a passion, you know, to something that people want. And that's more... You know, that tends to be things like uh, stores, restaurants, hotels, you know, stuff like that. I can't tell you how many times, you know, sitting at home with my wife will say, oh, you know, the Boathouse restaurant up in Traverse City has got a special this weekend. Let's go. Because she loves that place, you know. And so that's, you know, the, that's appealing to the passion. I must have that. Um, there's a guy. Anybody ever heard of Herschel Gordon Lewis? He's the guy who made the movies Blood Feast and 2000 Maniacs back in the 60s. He really, what he had was um, a commercial um, uh, commercial filmmaking business, but on the side, they were making these sleazy movies for the drive-in crowd. So he's kind of famous to some people for that, to a cult audience. But he was also a direct marketing and general marketing expert. I saw him at an event one time, and he said that there were only, he'd only been able to identify five business-to-business -business motivators in all his time in the business. One is community, people that want to be part of the crowd. I kind of noticed that with graphic designers and web developers, they want to be part of the Apple community. Yeah. You know, maybe that's, but that's also in a way exclusivity too, because in the early days, we're not like everybody else. We graphic designers and web developers, we don't work on Microsoft and on PCs, we do everything on Apple. <laughs> so exclusivity can be um, another uh, motivator. Pride, sometimes you just want to have the best products, you want to have the best uh, tools. Um, guilt, sometimes you do buy out of guilt. Somebody's done a favor for you and you feel like you need to do a favor for them or they're your family or your friends. But he said by far the biggest motivator is fear. And that relates to that, um, you know, that thing about appealing to people's pain. You know, people often question this. They say, what about costs? What about money? Well, when you're selling business to business, you're often selling to a purchasing department. That purchasing agent isn't really driven by the cost. In, to Herschel Gordon Lewis, he said they're driven by fear that they need to bring your costs down because they need to look good in their company. That you know that they'll lose their job if they don't get the best price. And so that's really that purchasing agent's motivation. He has never identified cost as a main driver in business to business. It's always these five. I, if you're in professional services, do I still have a few minutes? Okay. Good. Okay. Um, I really recommend the books by Barry Beckwith. They're really just very enjoyable to read, too. 
the three main uh, books that he wrote for professional services marketers are Selling the Invisible, The Invisible Touch, and What Clients Do. They tend to be somewhat repetitive, but they all take a little bit different angles on the story. So I do recommend them. This one is The Invisible Touch, and in that book he, recommend, he identified what he considers the four keys to marketing success. The first being brand, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that here just quickly. Now, again, that's a subject not of just a single LA2M method, that could be a, a subject for a whole class or maybe a, a field of study or something like that. But anyway, in my view, you have done your job developing a brand when you own an idea in your customer's mind. When they look at you and say, oh, you're this. And just to give you a couple of examples, well, I already mentioned these, you know, that um, Facebook is follow and be followed, or Twitter is follow and be followed, et cetera. You know, but let's jump right to the other ones. You know, Apple to me is cool gadgets. It's arguable, but that's how I see it. Zingerman's is comfort food, you know, kicked way up. Uh, University of Michigan, uh, public idea, you know, simple idea. LA2M, marketing education. So that's, those, those brands have, I, have carved out, at least in my mind, you know, ideas that they own. Now, what they all have in common, except for LA2M, is that they have a strong brand and that they charge a lot. LA2M doesn't charge much at all, except for passing the hat. So you might want to address that very well. Um, all of them are very, very well packaged. You know, design and brand consistency are all very important to those organizations, as you noticed, Apple, Zingerman's, Michigan, LA2M as well. And, but most of all, they have strong relationships with their customers. You know, strong, fruitful relationships. People are fiercely loyal to those. And I, I think that's true of LA2M. I've noticed it with the crowds that are here regularly and people who speak so highly of the group. Um, so, there we are. The summary is, here are your six methods. And what you're really getting at here is building a relationship. You know, that thing that Harry Beckwith talked about. If you have no relationship at all with somebody out there and they think they should be, you think you should have a relationship with them, you're going to have to get them somehow. And it might take prospecting or interrupting them to initiate the relationship. But eventually what you do is you want to move them up that ladder so that they are raving fans of your business and they're referring you to everybody they know. And so the process that we go through with our clients is we work through this question. You know, what will work most effectively and efficiently to help you find, win, and grow profitable customer relationships? And that is the end. There's my contact info. You can get in touch. I, it, you can tell me whether there's time for immediate questions. Actually, yeah, I was going to ask if there were any questions. Um, are there any questions? Okay. Sure. Hey, Eddie. Early on in your early on in your presentation, you spoke about driving force and, and really speaking to your driver force, driving force. How would you say that that difference differs from really pushing your differentiator, or is it the same? The driver uh, no, course. it's not exactly the same. Uh, I cut out a bunch of stuff in here. I do a, a longer version of this where I go into a lot like positioning, you know, and how important positioning is to figure out what your differentiator is and then how that translates to value for your targeted customers. Yeah. I didn't think there was time for all of that here. Um, you, yeah, th this, uh, this is um, the strategy pure and simple stuff is so basic that you know, you can't use it as the basis for things like that. But lots of times people, it does, I notice it does get them thinking like, yeah, we're, we need to move our focus a little bit. But yeah, but I left out the stuff because, you know, in my view, like, you know, if you, if you figure out that positioning, what you're going to give up to get, in other words, mm -hmm. your differentiator that drives you to particular clients, well, then that, that's the, the, uh, the driver for your basic strategy, your marketing plan. Okay. It even provides, you know, um, direction on... Uh, you know, your brand identity and your marketing message really strongly. So the differentiator is much broader than what you're talking about, right? Yeah. It, well, no, actually, the way it's much, much more specific and leads you really to more specific things, to more specific tools. Um, but yeah, maybe I should have left that in. Anyway, but still.
Oh, we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, anyone have a question? During the getting found, you talked about websites and being patient and persistent. Mm -hmm. I have a question. I wanted to know we're redoing our whole website. Does that mean that that's going to start over that like 18 months to a year to get up on Google, or is oh, that yeah. just with a new website? Oh, I don't think so. Not not that. I, I think you know your, your the equity that you built up from the previous okay. site should transfer over. In the cases I was talking about, these people really were starting from like either no site or a really bad website that wasn't serving them at all. But they wanted really instant results. I will add one thing to that though. Um, one of the examples was a church here in Ann Arbor, um, First Congregational Church of Ann Arbor. We um, helped them. They have a terrific. Uh, Oh, Jane Delancey is there. You, you probably know her. She comes here sometimes. She's there uh, uh, on a volunteer basis, their uh, webmaster. But uh, she thought it was a conflict of interest to develop the site. So we developed the site and turned it over to her. But um, they were really frustrated because they were not being found with their existing site on generic terms like Ann Arbor Church, Church Ann Arbor, even though they were a 150-year-old church with you know, prominent members and huge in the community and so on. Um, it took a long time before they moved up to, on those generic terms, but right from the start, they were able to rank number one on a, a very specific term, um, Progressive Church, Ann Arbor, Ann Arbor Progressive Church or whatever, because they, they're basically the only person saying that. So if you can figure out through a positioning process what your really specific message is, and, and you build a decent site, you can rank highly on it, maybe even number one, almost right away. But on the more generic, more competitive terms, it took quite a long time. Now I think they do rank really highly. The last time I looked, it was like third or fourth, typically, you know, depending on what data you searched. From going from like page five to high on page one, so, but yeah, it took a while. In your answer to the first question, you mentioned what you have to give up to get. Yeah. Can you tell me what you were referring to in that area? Yes. Um, you know, the basic uh, idea of positioning is that nobody, really nobody can be all things to all people. Um, you know, uh, Volkswagen has tried many times to be a luxury brand, but they just aren't. So they have to be what they are. And you have, you know, and the, the positioning process gets you to essentially, you know, who your target is and what need you're helping them, uh, you know, um, meet, what, uh, what your solution is, what value you provide, what alternatives they have, and then what's the differentiator that will make at least some of those people prefer you as, the, as their best source. But you just have to recognize that you're not going to get 100% of the market. Nobody does. And you have to decide what you can realistically get and what will be profitable for you. Okay, any other questions? Yeah, we'll cover it all. Okay, all right, thanks. Uh, and now we come to the uh, part of the program where we pass the mic crowd around and you uh, introduce yourselves. Um, it's um, helpful if you stand up so that people can, can see who you are. And then if you haven't asked, you can share that with us as well. Just, um, this, is the, this is not the time for another presentation. It's just a short <laughs> so, so yeah, I said keep it free because we're going to try and pass it all the way around the room in uh, 15 minutes, okay? So. Oh my gosh. I get to go first. My name is Leslie Arwin. This is my first time here. I'm the artist for a, an educational software development company, and our first product is ABC Airplane. It's a letter tracing game for children, and we've just submitted it to the Apple App Store. <coughs> Hi, I'm Dr. Wilkie Laven with Right and Left Straps, and um, we are an accessory to patient lifters, both for home care and institutions. But I just want to give a plug for Chris. Um, we first met him at Spark a couple of years ago. We walked in with our old website and our materials uh, to a marketing panel of experts and said, Here's what we want to do, here's where we are, what do we need to do, and he was excellent and very giving, just like he is now. Hello, I'm Derek, and I'm one of the only employees of uh, Lady Lipstrap, passing up. Hi, I'm Amy Long. <laughs> and I'm Jane Delancey, and I'm the 
thing, but uh, whichever sales thing might work for you, it's called happy hour. So whether you're having a bad day at work and you need to find a great happy hour in town, or you're having a good day at work and you want to find your favorite drink, you can download it for iOS, uh, I've got cards here, or you can just go search for happy hour deals, it's the purple icon, and the cards were made for that $5 bill printing, so thank you for that. And uh, yeah, check it out, it's free, can't beat it. There's. Uh, 40 happy hours tonight at, starting at 4 o'clock. There's three right now, just in case you know anyone. <laughs> All within a mile. That's just a mile. It covers Detroit, Birmingham, Royal Oak, Ferndale, Lansing, East Lansing. I forgot something. But anyway, check it out. Happy hour. Hi, I'm Kevin Packard from Foresight Group. We offer a wide array of printing services tailored to meet your individual needs. State, finishing up um, my senior year right now, and also interning at Nginx um, this semester. Uh, I'm Roger Rail. I'm a venture catalyst, and I help a lot of networking groups with different things like videoing. I also started a video meetup group. Our next meeting will be uh, second week, second Wednesday in uh, March. And uh, we outgrew our two first venues, so we're looking for a third venue. Um, I think we got a couple ideas. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, we, yeah we, the, there were six of us that stayed after the last meeting and um, did some debriefing. And it turned out at Cubs AC there was a trivia night. And we were in first place, so we couldn't leave. 
Oh, the game was, we ended up uh, tying and winning like $25. Hi, I'm Krishna Hakatika. I'm working on my master's in public relations, and I'm interning at Ingenius. I'm Roger Hart, former executive editor of Auto Week magazine in Detroit uh, for 13 years, and now uh, working as uh, uh, providing photography and writing content for a variety of different clients around the world. Hi, I'm Erin. I am the content producer and the next digital marketing and one of the LA Tim live tweeters. Hi, I'm Laura Schneider. I'm also one of the live tweeters for LA Tim and the social media coordinator at NGENX. Oops. Sorry. Does this still work? Yes, it does. Wow. Even even without this, it still works. Uh, my name is Cole Whiteman. Uh, I'm a uh, uh, web developer and process architect at uh, the University of Michigan. Uh, I found this very interesting, as I uh, usually find the LA2M presentations interesting, because every few years I kind of work with that to how am I going to market myself one of these days? So who knows? Maybe I'll be one person business one of these days. Um, uh, developing uh, big diagrams to demystify the complex systems. Who knows? Hi, I'm Pete Ayers, and I'm a web developer with Move Communications. Can you repair mics? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jessica Hoffman. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing for Google Search Engines. I'm Dave Menzo with Move Communications. We tell your story through impact. We help you form your brand. And also, uh, we are accepting uh, interns for a spring and summer semester. If you have anybody, please spread the word. Hi, I'm Laura and I'm a client experience manager at Intel. Rob with Let's Go Social Media Marketing and Training, um, this month's sponsor. If any of you remember to bring your card, I gave you guys a business card with the number on the back of it. The magic number is nine. So whether it's nine or 19 or 29 or 31. <laughs> <laughs> My bad. <laughs> but, um, so I have um, some lovely business card cases, leather, smooth for um, any of the winners. If we don't have enough winners, we may have to. 31. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it looks like we may have to. <laughs> but the nine is representative of the nine ways um, that I want to help you become the social solopreneur on March the 13th. Yeah. 13th is opposite of 31. <laughs> <laughs> you know you're a genius. <laughs> I'm Carter Sherwin from Print Studios and I'm a commercial editorial and portrait photographer. And I've been sneaking around getting a few pictures of me on the group's Facebook page. And thanks to uh, Carter for uh, taking the, the pictures every week. Um, those, as he said, will go up on our Facebook page. And um, he's he's one busy guy, so it's a real asset for him to be here. And also thanks to our sponsor, Let's Go Social Media, Leslie McGraw, uh, for the month of February. Um, we still have a sponsorship available for June for this season, so uh, if you have any interest in, in any of that, uh, that um, would um, be something to talk to me about. And thanks, Chris. That was that was a really informative talk, very valuable. I'm sure people uh, really took a lot of good information. We have a, another round of applause for Chris. Our, and our, now our official photograph of, of the presentation of the L.A. 2M t-shirt. Our uh, speaker next week is uh, our Tom Crawford right here, who will be uh, speaking on um, developing great presentations, which is something we really all need to do. Um, shabby presentations just don't cut it these days, so uh, it'll be well worth your time to, to come in and hear what Tom has to say. He's spoken on this once before. And, and he, he really knows his stuff, so it, it will be really worth your time to, to come back next week and see what he has to say. So thank you for coming out, and I uh, hope to see you next week. Thanks. Bye. So who has their time? <laughs> <laughs> Hello? 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 Hello?